Okay, so we're going to go over these things right here. This is from chapter five. Uh, we're going to go over diffusion and osmosis. And uh, we're going to hit on some things. Facilitated diffusion, which is still diffusion. Active transport, which requires ATP. And then secondary active transport, which is, uh, I'll go over that when, uh, when we get to it. Uh, but it's kind of a mix of the two. Okay, so if we remember, we have a cell and the cell has this interstitial fluid, which is extracellular. And these are the, these are the breakdowns. It's about two thirds of all fluid, uh, of all of your body water is inside cells. And then about a third is the uh, extracellular fluid. Okay, so uh, we have, and I put these arrows here, we have particles that need to go in, this could be glucose or oxygen, uh, and particles that need to go out, that, that could be carbon dioxide, um, and other kinds of waste that need to move in and out of these cells. And so we need to talk about how that's, how that's going to happen, uh, because it happens differently for different molecules. Okay, so first of all, we're going to start talking about diffusion. Important things, important points about diffusion is that it's passive. And by passive, that just means that it will happen without an input of energy. That ju it just happens, okay? So if you put perfume in the middle of the room, it is going to diffuse out and it's going to try to equal out the concentration so it's evenly distributed. So that's what diffusion, that's what happens with diffusion, okay? But as we know, our cells aren't necessarily always this way. Sometimes there are, especially when we have a membrane, there's a higher concentration on one side than the other. Okay, uh, But this is diffusion. It's a passive process. It moves, and this is very important, from a high concentration to a lower concentration. And we call that a chemical gradient. Um, because usually we're talking about chemicals. These particles we're talking about are some kind of chemical. Okay, net movement until the concentration is equal, so it moves to equilibrium, which is what we saw here, and it's rapid over short distances. Okay, so that means that it kind of bounces around when things move, they don't always just move in a straight line, but that means in a short distance, it's very rapid, but in a long distance, you can see where it would take much more time. Okay, so this is sort of uh, logical. It's directly related to temperature, and this too is pretty simple. Molecules are constantly moving around, okay? At higher temperatures, they're moving around more quickly, and at low temperatures, they're moving around more slowly. So you can imagine that if something is diffusing, if it's at a low temperature, it goes pretty slow, and if it's at a fast temperature, it goes much more quickly, okay? Uh, in the body, we keep things at 37 degrees, so that's the ideal temperature for diffusion. Okay, in the human body. Um, inversely related to molecular weight and size. Yes, larger things tend to bump into stuff and they tend to move more slowly. Okay, something that's smaller will have fewer obstacles and it will move more quickly. Okay, in an open system or across a partition. Okay, so this is getting to the point that what we're ultimately talking about here is movement across a cell membrane. Okay, some things will move across a cell membrane. They'll simply diffuse across a, a cell membrane. Other things need carriers, they need channels, or in some cases, if it's going up its concentration gradient, it needs a pump. Okay, but a pump, active transport, is not diffusion. Diffusion is passive, so remember that. Okay, so this is just an example. Uh, it shows a couple of things, potassium iodine, Congo red dye, uh, and you can see here that it's diffusing. Okay, so it's diffusing from one point to uh, it's going to diffuse out until it reaches a uh, concentration equilibrium. Okay, so here are some points and these are, these are things that you need to know. Diffusion uses kinetic energy, that means energy of motion, and that's how diffusion takes place because everything is in motion. Okay, so it will tend to bounce off of each other until it reaches an equilibrium. Okay, uh, molecules diffuse from an area of higher concentration to lower concentration, so we mentioned that. So that we call that going down its concentration gradient from a high concentration to a lower concentration. We say down its concentration gradient. Diffusion continues until concentrations come to equilibrium. Okay, that doesn't mean that everything just stops. It still moves around. So these are these guys are still moving around even though they're at an equilibrium, but they will maintain that equilibrium, okay? They're not going to bunch up, and if they do, they will then 
go back out. So, so on average, everything is pretty much evenly spaced when it's at equilibrium. Okay, diffusion is faster, and we just went through this. Higher concentration gradients, okay? If you have a higher concentration gradient here than here, it will diffuse more quickly. If we have less of a concentration gradient, it will still diffuse, but it'll diffuse more slowly, okay? Okay, so over shorter distances, we mentioned that. If it's uh, at higher temperatures, because it's moving more quickly, um, the shorter distances, that's, that's also, I don't remember if I mentioned that, but that's also just if you have something because it's moving around so much, if it's moving a, a, long, a further distance, it's going to take longer. I think I mentioned that. Uh, smaller molecules move more quickly. Okay. Uh, diffusion can take place in an open system or across partition. So the rate, so if we talk about movement across a membrane, there are some important points that you need to pay attention to here. Okay, so lots of these are just kind of, kind of common sense. If the membrane surface area is larger, well, if you have a bunch of particles up here that are going to diffuse, if they don't all just have to fit into this area to diffuse, if they can just go across anywhere, if they have a larger surface area, then you're going to have more diffusion. The membrane is thinner, so this is why the inside of our lungs, the alveoli on the inside of our lungs, have very thin membranes, because oxygen has to diffuse and carbon dioxide has to diffuse in and out, okay? Oxygen in, carbon dioxide out. Um, the concentration gradient is larger, we mentioned that, and the membrane is more permeable to the molecule. So that brings up, and this is where we're getting into a very important point, this right here, because this is gonna keep coming up the rest of the semester. Membrane permeability to a molecule. Well, what does that mean if it's permeable or not permeable? And one of the most important things is its lipid solubility. So if something is lipid soluble, that means that it is soluble. That means that it tends to be more hydrophobic, which means that it is nonpolar. Nonpolar. Okay. So these are going to be more soluble. They're going it's so that means a molecule that is hydrophobic, nonpolar, same essentially the same thing. Uh, they're going to be able to diffuse through a membrane. So if this is our lipid bilayer, something that is nonpolar isn't going to interact. We'll just draw that. Something that's nonpolar isn't going to interact with these polar head groups. So if it's polar, it's going to bounce off. Meanwhile, if it's nonpolar, there's no electrical activity, okay? and so it's going to diffuse right through, as long as it's small enough, okay? which is where we get into the molecule size and the lipid concentration composition of the membrane. Okay? So membranes have different comp compensations, and so uh, depending on the compensation of the membrane, how much cholesterol there is, for instance, uh, how many uh, different China type of sugar moieties we call that uh, is going to is going to change that. Okay, so if we get a picture of that, we can see here that's what this is showing. Lipid solubility again, very important. So if it's lipid soluble, well, this is a lipid primarily. Um, it's going to move through. Now we have this polar head group, but the polar head group only recognizes things that are either charged or polar themselves. So if it's hydrophobic it's going to move right through as long as it's small enough. Okay, so if it's small enough. So a lot of things like, like steroids, so several hormones, especially steroidal hormones, will simply move right through the membrane. So they can just be released into the blood and they'll move all over the place. There's something else called nitric acid, or uh, yeah, nitric acid, that's, uh, that, will move, that will move through. Um, and so, so that's, that's another one, okay? That will simply move through the uh, move through the membrane. Okay. So, what if things can't move through the membrane easily? Then, for instance, water. Sometimes, sometimes we want a cell to be more permeable to water or less permeable to water. There are water channels. We're going to talk about those when we talk about the kidneys. There are ion channels. Those are going to be important all the way through, uh, because ions like sodium and like potassium which tend to be, if I make this my membrane, potassium tends to be at a high concentration inside the cell, which means that we need a channel to let the potassium out, okay? 
and we might need a channel to let the sodium in. But we want to maintain that concentration gradient, so we have different kinds of channels. Sometimes we have chemically gated channels, which will only open if the chemical or if the uh, if a uh, if something binds to it to open it. This is what we see with neurotransmitters like glutamate or dopamine or something like that. That might lead to a channel being opened and then be becoming permeable to sodium or potassium. Okay, voltage gated. Now, if we have a voltage change, usually the inside of a cell is about minus 70 millivolts. Okay, well, if that changes to let's say minus 55 millivolts, it might open a channel and it might let the sodium move in, okay, or the potassium move out. And then mechanically gated, we see that when we uh, when we touch something, our tactile senses, our sense of touch is is something moving, okay. Even our hearing is mechanically gated channels. When something moves, it may open a channel and it may let something move across, okay. So that's what channels are. Now it's still going to be diffusion because this is still going from a high concentration to a low concentration because sodium is at a higher concentration on the outside of the cell, but it's facilitated by this channel. Okay, so we actually call that facilitated diffusion. Okay, so if we look at a uh, if we look at a channel here, these are just proteins. So it's a this is an alpha helix and it's got you know these pro these amino acids all in a row and they come together and they attach and and uh, so this one's going to be going to the one back behind. Um, and so if you look at them from the top or from the bottom, you can see that it creates here on the right, it creates a pore okay, that goes right through this area. Okay, So that's where the pore is. So it's just a protein channel. Um, and so that's, that's, that can be very specific. Or it can be non-specific. You can just let a whole lot of stuff in. Uh, generally, they tend to be uh, very specific, though. Okay, so that's an example of a membrane channel. Okay, so that let's see takes us to something called, and I mentioned this just briefly, facilitated diffusion. Now, glucose. We have a cell here. Glucose tends to be at a high concentration outside the cell. Okay, usually it can it can vary. It depends on the cell, but usually glucose is a higher concentration outside the cell, and and it's for a good reason. Um, and I'll get to that, and that's what this shows why it doesn't stay at a high concentration because it's turned into either glycogen or it goes through the process of glycolysis, and the glucose simply goes away. So, but glucose is polar. And it can't move, it can't simply diffuse across. It's not hydrophobic, it's hydrophilic. So that means it needs a carrier. Okay? Carrier. So even though it's still moving down its concentration gradient, it can't simply move across the cell like some of these steroid hormones I mentioned can do. So this is here a picture of a carrier. Okay, so the glucose will go in, it can bind, and then this will close and then open up on the other side and the glucose can move out. Okay, so that's a carrier. So the question, questions that are going to be on the exam and that kind of thing are, is this still diffusion? Okay, yes, it's called facilitated diffusion. Does it require energy? No, it doesn't require any energy. It requires a carrier. Okay, that still means because it's moving down its concentration gradient, high concentration to low concentration, it's still diffusion. It just needs a carrier, which makes it facilitated diffusion. Okay, so don't get that don't get that mixed up. Okay, so here we can see something that is called active transport, and this is why it's going to be confusing, because active transport is not diffusion. Okay. Why isn't it diffusion? Because it's going from a low concentration to high concentration. Diffusion, that breaks the rules of diffusion. Um, that means that this molecule here, which is a potassium, so right up here, that's a potassium, uh, 
it doesn't want to move in that direction. These guys would like to move out, they would like to diffuse out, but they can't because they hit that membrane and that's going to keep them in there, okay? So unless there's a channel, these potassium are stuck in there. And how do they get there? They get there with, this is called the sodium potassium pump and it requires ATP, okay? So it's, it's, it's also called the sodium potassium ATP ACE because it breaks down ATP. So the sodium potassium ATP ACE. And so the sodium potassium ATP ACE will pump in a couple, two, potassium, and at the same time, it will pump out three sodium. So two potassium move in and three sodium move out every time it burns an ATP. Nothing is diffusing here, it's pumped. Okay, so this is an actual pump. Okay. Okay, and it, and it requires ATP. Okay, so if we look at this uh, in a little more detail, we can see that if you have, it says here that sodium concentrations are high out here, okay, and low in here. Okay. And so what happens is this thing is opened up, and every time a potassium or a, a sodium wanders over, it will then bind to these binding sites. And once they're bound, it will close and then open on the other side, and it will release these sodium to the other side. And so it keeps pumping. Notice here, it burns an ATP every time it does that. Okay. So it keeps doing that. Uh, and then once it's open on this side, okay, here, then potassium, which is at a low concentration outside the cell, will bind and then it will release that potassium into the cell. Okay. And so every time it goes through one of these back and forth cycles, it burns a molecule of ATP or it hydrolyzes a molecule of ATP. Okay, so that makes it active. So that's active transport. Okay. Because it requires ATP. Okay, so that's not diffusion. All right. So now we have this other thing called secondary active transport. Now, sometimes you can do something where glucose, it says here that glucose is at a low concentration on the outside. So this is extracellular. It's at a low concentration outside the cell, which means that it doesn't want to diffuse in even with a carrier. Okay, so this might be um, a cell you're trying to, whatever, you're trying to move glucose into the cell. Um, but there isn't a pump. This is not a pump. What it does is that it takes advantage of the high concentration of sodium. Okay, so sodium will keep binding that and it will actually cause, when the sodium binds, it will cause a conformational change that will push the glucose here. Okay, so sodium trying to move into the cell, okay, because it's at a low concentration inside the cell and a high concentration, so it's trying to move down its concentration gradient, will actually at the same time pull a glucose molecule into the cell with it. Okay, so while this is not active transport, we do have, we do see this little issue here where glucose is being pulled against its concentration gradient. Okay, so we say, well, that's going to require energy because the law of the universe says that we're trying to maintain entropy or disorder. Okay, so it's, it's saying that, no, this is not something that should happen naturally. Things don't become orderly and, and glucose doesn't move all together just all by itself. So it requires energy. So where does the energy come from? If it's not burning ATP here, which it's not, okay, so that's not taking place on this, it's taking place over here, okay? It's using, this transporter is using the concentration gradient that you made with the sodium potassium pump. Does the sodium potassium pump use ATP? Does it hydrolyze ATP? Yes, it does. Okay, so it burns or it hydrolyzes an ATP molecule to pump that sodium out. Okay, and then that sodium concentration gradient is used to drive this glucose in. Okay, 
So we have two different systems here. So we can't say, so we can't look at this and we can't say, oh, well, you know, glucose moving into the cell is active transport because I will say, okay, show me, show me the ATP. Show me where it hydrolyzes ATP. And you'll say, well, it, it doesn't hydrolyze ATP. Then how does it work? It uses the concentration gradient. Where did that come from? It came from the sodium potassium pump, which does use ATP. Okay, so that's why we call it secondary active transport. Still requires energy, but the energy comes from a different place. Okay, it comes from this creating the concentration gradient. The concentration gradient then forces that glucose in. And there are lots of things that use these. Uh, amino acids um, can be moved across membranes. Um, there are neurotransmitters, certain neurotransmitters that will that will use a gradient to move them into the vesicle, so they can be packaged and then released as neurotransmitters like dopamine and serotonin. Okay, so so this system is used a lot, and it's important because it does it sort of mixes this idea of diffusion or facilitated diffusion with this pumping mechanism, but the pumping mechanism is actually driven by a separate pump that's creating the concentration gradient. Okay, so I hope that makes sense. Okay, so we have kind of a, uh, here, this is more or less a summary, uh, but I want to point out a couple of more terms. So here's a channel protein that creates a, just a water-filled pore. Okay, so that's a, that's a, a channel that can just allow things to move. Now it can be specific, uh, it can be gated, and this shows how it's gated, and it can be turned off and on. So we kind of talked about that, mechanically gated, voltage gated, um, or ligand gated, or chemically gated. So there are lots of different gating mechanisms that can happen, or a few. Uh, and then it can just be an open pore, or a channel. And then we talked about carriers, okay? So we have these carriers, and so we saw that here. This is kind of a carrier, and then we saw... Um, this this is a this is a carrier a glucose carrier okay so but there are a couple of things remember when if if you look here remember when we were looking at that we said okay it's using the concentration gradient of sodium to carry glucose into the cell and they're going in the same direction okay they're both going into the cell well that doesn't always happen, okay? So uh, when they when they're both going in the same direction, we call that symport. But sometimes they go in opposite directions. So here you can see that, like with the sodium ATPase, the sodium is going in one direction; it's going out of the cell, and the potassium is going into the cell. Okay, so we call that antiport. So that's antiport. So transport. Uh, symport is the same sim, and then we have over here the uniport carrier that just that just this is just a carrier that's just allowing glucose to move down its concentration gradient. Okay, um, so it doesn't it's not specifying whether these are active or passive. We know that um, facilitated diffusion, which is this, and it's moving down its concentration gradient. If it's not using ATP, then it's uh, then it's facilitated diffusion. It's still diffusion. It just requires that uh, that carrier to do it. Okay, so a so few important things here. Um, carrier mediated, if it requires a carrier, that means that, or if it requires some kind of, of path to get through, if it's not just simply going across the membrane, um, if it requires a path to go through, this path can get clogged up. Okay, so that means that there's some competition. Okay. Oh, and I didn't mention specificity. These can, things can be very specific. So if we're just talking about sodium, or better example, because this happens in the kidney, if we're just talking about glucose, then this transporter, this carrier, can get clogged up. And that's why diabetics have glucose in their urine, because they have so much glucose in their blood that the kidneys can't filter it all because this carrier or these carriers that are in the membrane get saturated okay so here's a carrier there in the membrane we'll outline it in blue there 
Okay, so that's the carrier and it's getting saturated. It can only take so much glucose. I'm drawing it as a channel, which sometimes it is a channel, or a carrier where it's actually where it's actually moving it across. Okay, so it can get saturated and it can reach a maximum. And if that takes place in your kidneys, when your blood glucose levels are very, very high because the insulin is either not working or not present, then then the glucose levels build up to such a point that they they get bottlenecked here and they can't they can't make it through and so they end up just moving out and they continue through the kidneys and they come out as in the urine okay so that's where saturation is really noticed is in the uh is in the kidneys with glucose okay so remember that if it's if it requires a carrier then that carrier can only work so fast okay and it can become saturated now remember homeostasis does not mean equilibrium. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Well, I've been mentioning that inside the cell we have a high concentration of potassium. Outside the cell we have a high concentration of sodium at equilibrium. Okay, so, or at homeostasis, I'm sorry. We have a high concentration of sodium, and this is at homeostasis, just to make sure I'm clear on that. If this were at equilibrium, then the concentration of sodium would be the same inside and out, but your cells would die. They will not function that way. They only function, except in the few instances that we'll talk about when we talk about muscles and nerves, um, they only function properly with sodium at a high concentration on the outside and potassium at a high concentration on the inside. This is at homeostasis. Okay, So we're constantly at chemical disequilibrium. Okay, Your, your cells are very specific about what, which molecules they want there. We're also at electrical disequilibrium. Because remember I said the inside of the cell, so if we talk about electrical, the inside of the cell is at about minus 70 millivolts. Okay, that's not equilibrium. Okay, if it were at equilibrium, it would be the same both in and out. It would be zero. There would be no difference. But in this case, it shows that it's about minus 70 on the inside of the cell. Okay, so there that is at homeostasis. The cell is at homeostasis. It's minus 70 on the inside, high potassium on the inside, high sodium on the outside. It is not at equilibrium. However, and this is what we're going to talk about now, it is at osmotic equilibrium. Okay, so what is osmosis, or what did we mean by osmotic equilibrium? Well, water has a tendency, so if we draw the blue, we draw these as water molecules. Water can move into and out of the cells, most of them, except a few examples or a few, a few uh, exceptions, particularly in the kidney that we'll talk about when we talk about the renal section. But water tends to be at the same concentration inside and outside. However, if you have a buildup of molecules, let's say we have a buildup of molecules inside the cell, well those molecules want to, if they're, if you have, and this could be anything, I, I know I drew potassium here, but there are lots and lots of proteins, lots of different molecules inside and outside the cell. So if we have lots more molecules inside the cell than outside the cell, that changes our concentration of water. Okay, so that means that this is very dilute out here. Okay, so I'm gonna, I don't know if I like using green there. So this is very dilute on the outside. And the word we use for that is hypoosmotic. Okay, so hypo. It's referring to the concentration. So if it's very dilute and there aren't very many particles on the outside, we say it's hypoosmotic on the outside. However, on the inside, we say that it's hyperosmotic. That means that the concentration on the inside is much higher. So how is water going to respond to that? Well, if water can move across the cell membrane, 
and move into the cell. That's what it's going to do. The water is going to move into the cell until it evens, evens out that concentration difference, okay? It doesn't care the identity. It just says, oh, we have way more molecules on the inside of the cell than the out, and so the water will move in. So all those extra molecules that are in there will work like a sponge, and they will suck that water up, and the cell will swell. It will get larger, okay? So that's what happens. The cell gets larger, and if it gets too large, it can actually burst, okay? okay? So if it gets too big, it'll burst. So as the water is moving in to try to even out that concentration difference, the cell gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and then it can actually break, okay? And so we don't want that, especially with our blood cells. That's why we have things like 0.9% saline. We have an iso-osmotic, iso-osmotic, um, when we hang a, a drip bag or something like that, if we give uh, IV fluids, uh, we make sure they're isoosmotic, that they're not going to cause these cells, the water, to either move into or out. We try to match the concentration inside and outside the cell. Okay, so I hope this makes sense. And we'll say, I'll go over it again. Um, so if we look at the concentration, so body compartments are in a state of chemical disequilibrium. So we mentioned that, and we see here intracellular fluid, we see a whole lot of potassium, okay? So we see the potassium levels are very high here, okay? We also see that there are a lot of proteins inside the cell. But if we look um, outside the cell at this interstitial fluid, then we can see that we have a lot of, and we've already mentioned it, sodium, and we also have a lot of, oops, we also have a lot of chloride on the outside of the cell. So, so they're not the same, but if you look at the concentrations, the concentrations are roughly equal. When you take everything into account and you add, all up, add up all of these little bars, if you take everything into account, you should have approximately the same concentration here and here and here, okay? So we should have the same, approximately the same concentration. Now the plasma uh, can be a little bit different. Um, but inside intracellular, inside the cell, and interstitial, outside the cell, because those are in close contact with one another, um, those are always going to be the same, even though the actual molecules inside and out are different. Now, if we have too much, let's say uh, we get too much chloride or something inside the cell, that is going to draw in water, okay? So that's going to mean water is going to move into the cell, okay? Or if we have too much water on the outside, or if we have too much, uh, let's say we end up with too much, we'll just use this as an example, too much potassium, okay? So we give a IV fluid and it has a whole bunch of potassium. Well, if you have a whole bunch of potassium, it is actually going to suck water out of the cell and move it into this extracellular or interstitial fluid. So it's going to move it out, okay? So this can constantly take place. So that means since the water can move, we're always at osmotic equilibrium, even though these tend to be, tend to be different. So we want everything to be exactly where it's supposed to be, okay? All right, so if we look at water concentrations, uh, I know I've seen a lot of things, and that's why I left this slide in here, uh, that say that we're like 90% water, 95% water, 99% water. Uh, well, that's not exactly true. Uh, you can see here the breakdown. Um, probably most of, most of you fall into this category here. So that means if you're male, about 61%, female, about 51% water. Okay, so we're about half, a little over half. Uh, water if you just if you just look at it uh, by total body weight okay um, all right so we really need to understand so uh, uh, well I showed this earlier but we we need to understand this concept of osmosis so this is this is again showing showing the differences in in where the fluid is distributed okay so we have we have quite a bit of fluid uh, inside the cell or outside the cell and, uh, and in the plasma, but we have way more intracellular fluid. So we mentioned that earlier, about two thirds of our water is inside the cells. Okay, so we need to understand this concept of osmotic 
pressure. And maybe you understood it the first time around, but in case you didn't, uh, here's another here's another way of looking at it. So if we say this is a selectively permeable membrane here, so so this thing right here is supposed to represent a cell membrane, and what it's saying is that if we have non-penetrating, okay, so it really only matters, right, if the if the particles are non-penetrating. If they can if they can simply move across, well, they're just going to diffuse across. That's not a big deal. So we're only interested in the ones that can't move across. So that's the only thing that matters is that it's non-penetrating. If it's, if it's blocked, so these guys obviously want to diffuse across, but they're blocked, they can't. Okay, so that's why it's semi-permeable or selectively permeable uh, because these guys are blocked. So those are non-penetrating. And so, your cells are always at osmotic equilibrium. Okay, so that means that the concentration inside and outside is always going to be the same. And that's because even though these particles can't move, the water can't. So we're still going to, and this is the rule of nature, is that you still maintain this concentration, this concentration gradient will even out in your body. If there is a concentration gradient, it doesn't matter the identity. The only thing that matters is that they can't move across that membrane. And so it's going to level out. And that's what we see here. We see that, okay, since the particles can't move, the water, okay, this water here will move and it'll move across, okay, to try to even that out. And that causes pressure. Okay, so it's pushing up right there. And so you can see that that doesn't look very natural. The only thing holding that water in there are all of these particles. Okay, so it doesn't matter what the particles are. It can be salts, it can be salts, proteins, salts. I'll fix that. Proteins, it doesn't really matter. Okay, what these are, they're just particles that can't move. Okay, so that creates pressure, and so you can see that that's pushing up on that. Now, if you can imagine that in a cell where you have a cell with a lot of non-penetrating particles on the inside and not very many on the outside, then we're going to say that the inside is hyperosmotic or hypertonic, okay, because we're talking about non-penetrating. So we can say that this is hypertonic in here, and this is in a hypotonic. This is hypo. This is... By default, this is going to be hyper, okay? This is more water, fewer particles. This is more particles. The hyper refers to particles. More particles, less water. So that means that water is going to push in to try to level that out, to even that out, okay? And that's going to cause this thing to swell and possibly burst, okay? Uh, and so this is just showing that you that it actually is creating a force that you put a magnet on it to push it down and so the water is pushing 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 and that's what we call osmotic pressure okay so buildup of osmotic pressure inside your cells is not a good thing it can cause them to uh, to burst okay so now if we just look at osmolarity and I know this can be confusing because in a minute we're going to be talking about tonicity hypertonic and hypotonic. Um, when we talk about osmolarity, all we're talking about is concentration. That's concentration. It doesn't matter whether it's whether these can penetrate or whether they can't. In fact, glucose can move across the cell. There are carriers for glucose. So if I give you a solution with a whole lot of glucose in it, the glucose is just going to move into your cell. Um, but still, when we talk about osmolarity, we still say, okay, if solution A has one osmolarity or osmol of glucose per liter, um, then and solution B has two, then we would say that B is hyperosmotic. It has a higher concentration than A. Okay. Now, since we don't, since we're only concerned with concentration and not guess we can say identity, then if we say we have one milliosmol of sodium chloride and one milliosmol of glucose, that it's going to be isoosmotic. Okay? 
Okay, so so that means that these are the same concentration. C is going to be the same concentration as A. Okay. Uh, however, C is hypoosmotic to B because B has two. Okay, so it's this more concentrated two osmoles uh, per liter, two osmolarity, um, osmolar. Uh, lots of words for that. Um, but but this has two, so it's more highly concentrated than one. So that means that one is hypoosmotic to B, or C is hypoosmotic to B, hypo, lower concentration, and B is hyper, higher concentration, to C, which has a lower concentration. It's also hyperosmotic to A. So this one is hyperosmotic to both. Okay, but these are isoosmotic to each other, okay? Which we see here and here. Okay, so I hope that I hope that makes sense. Now, um, there's another concept called tonicity, and tonicity refers to non-penetrating. Okay, so that's that's very specific that it's that it's a non-penetrating uh, molecule. So if we talk about a cell, and we say that this cell has a concentration of whatever. Okay. If you want to call it two, you can call it two. But these can't move, they can't get out. And so that means if I put it into something, or if I put, a, I put this into a solution that has a lower concentration, let's say one, uh, then because these can't move out and water can freely move across the membrane, water is going to move in. So what we have is we have solution A, okay? If this solution out here is hypotonic, then that means that the cell is going to swell. It's going to pull that water in. So it's, these particles are gonna act like a sponge and they're just gonna suck up that water. If it's isotonic, that means that the that means that the concentration inside and out is the same. Okay, so we have the same concentration inside and out. So that means there's going to be no net movement of water. So it's not going to change in size, and that's what we want when we when we give uh, IV fluids, unless they're dehydrated or something like that. We try to just give an isotonic solution. Okay, we want the same concentration inside and outside of non-penetrating. It doesn't matter so much if they're penetrating because if they're if you put in a penetrating uh, molecule, well, if it's at a higher concentration, it'll just move in. Okay? So that's not a big deal. Okay? It's these non-penetrating ones like sodium chloride. Okay? Now sodium chloride is enabled to just move in. The cell is very sure that it 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 decides when sodium and chloride and potassium can move in and out. But glucose, there are usually carriers for glucose. Okay? So if you end up, and I'll just start this over, sort of, uh, if you end up with this last example of a cell that is in, so if this is our cell, and we put in a hypertonic solution, okay, so, so the solution on the outside is hypertonic, which means that it has more particles, then which way is the water going to move? And if you said the water is going to move out, yes, these particles, they do. They act, that's how it works in my head. They act like a sponge and they just suck that water right out of there and the cell will shrink, okay? So hopefully hopefully that makes, that makes good sense to you. Um, okay, so, so here are some rules. Assume that all intracellular solute, solutes are non-penetrating, okay? So that's, that's kind of the assumption we make. Uh, compare osmolarities before the cell is exposed to the solution. Um, so, so when we say it's hypertonic and hypotonic, yes, we know that is that it's going to correct and the water is going to move and try to make it isotonic. So we say, okay. Um, so we say, all right. So when you first, if you put in a high, high salt solution, if you inject that into someone, that means that you're injecting a hypertonic solution. Okay, yes, the cells will expand um, because that, or they're going to shrink, right? So if we have, 
our bloodstream with our little blood cells here and we put in a hypertonic solution that's going to suck the water right out of there okay Okay, and these will shrink, okay? And then after a while, it'll be isotonic or isoosmotic, okay? But so when we talk about that, we say that when you first put it in. Um, tonicity of a solution describes the volume change of a cell at equilibrium, okay? So when we talk about hypertonic and hypotonic, we're talking about this. We're talking about whether the cell will swell, whether it will shrink, how the water, how the water will move, okay? Um, Determine tonicity by comparing non-penetrating. So we mentioned that non-penetrating solute concentrations in the cell and solution. The net water movement is in the compartment with the higher. So water moves to, so that's what this is saying, water moves toward the higher concentration of solutes. Okay. And hypo, hypoosmotic solutions are always hypotonic. Okay, so let's look at some of these now because this is what's going to be important and hopefully you'll learn it again in another class, but this is where you're learning it here. If we have 0.9% saline, okay, also known as normal saline, it's isoosmotic, okay, and it's isotonic, okay. So this is the concentration of particles inside and outside your cells. Okay. Now, here on the second line, we also have 0.9% saline, okay, which we already just saw is iso, isoosmotic, isotonic. Okay. But now we're adding dextrose. Dextrose is D-glucose, so it's, uh, it's glucose. We can see the little subscript down here or the little footnote. Uh, and so now we're putting dextrose in. Well, okay. We call that D5, 5% dextrose, normal saline. That means it's at a higher concentration, right? Okay, so that means that if we have our little cells and we put that in there, there's our saline. And so that was fine, same concentration inside and out. But now we have this glucose molecules in there too. Well, that means that it's hyperosmotic, right? It's hyperosmotic. It's got more particles. However, those particles can move in, okay? So they'll just move to wherever they need to go. It doesn't affect, the cell is not going to shrink because of that. So that means the tonicity is isotonic because these aren't, aren't non-penetrating. There's a double negative. These can penetrate, they can go wherever, okay? So we don't worry about that. We don't care about it, okay? Because it's just going to go somewhere. So if someone is, needs the extra energy because the cells require glucose, a lot of times they give 5% dextrose. It's okay, you know, uh, because those that dextrose will just find its way into the cell, and that's actually helpful. It's not going to make the cell explode or anything. Okay, 5% dextrose in water. Well, this is a problem, okay, because if we only put on the outside of the cell, if we only have, we'll make the cell, if we only have dextrose on the outside of the cell, then what we're doing is we're actually adding, and this was these were our particles before, we're actually adding a whole lot of water, okay? So that means that we're increasing the amount of water out here, which is actually going to make it more dilute, right? We're diluting just like you would if you poured water into your lemonade, you're making it more dilute. These molecules are going to move farther apart because there's more water. And then you're going to be in a situation where the outside of the cell, even though it has glucose in it, is actually hypotonic. Okay, And so that means that with, yeah, sure, these can move in, but that doesn't fix all that water you put in there. And so that water is going to be sucked in as well. Okay. So the water is going to move, the water is going to move in and this cell will swell, okay? So that means it's the same thing as putting it in if it were just water, okay? Uh, and if you just put in water, it's going to dilute this and the cell will swell, okay? Because if you, if you dilute the outside, so these particles are too far apart, uh, 
then the water is going to move in. That, those particles that are non-penetrating particles that are in there are going to act like a sponge and they're going to suck it in. Okay. So same thing here. If we only have half the saline, we're diluting it still, just not quite as much. It's going to be hypotonic. The cell is going to swell. 5% dextrose, same thing. We're still not fixing the problem. It's still going to be hypotonic because remember the dextrose is free to move in or out. Okay, so that can be confusing, and uh, I'm sorry it took so long. I'm always sorry it takes so long, uh, but there's a lot of, a lot of information. So uh, hopefully this makes a lot of sense.